Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mental Health First Aid. We're going to wait for a few people to jump on here. We are excited to have you guys here today as we begin to talk about emotional first aid for children. But not only that, we are going to talk about how you as the care provider can take care of yourself so that you can help you with first aid before you help your child or the child that you're caring for with first aid. For those of you guys who don't know, my name is Nicole Jackson. I'm a doctor in forensic psychology. And today, I have the wonderful John D. White is here with me. Hi, John D. And she is the author of the book for the reason we are here today. This mental health and healing series is going to go on and on and on. But I am absolutely honored to have John D as our first guest on here. And to be quite honest, I believe that it's necessary, especially for the times that we are dealing with right now. So I'm going to hand it over to Miss John D and she is going to introduce herself to you guys. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me on. This is going to be great fun for me too, because I'm very passionate about the subject. And I think it's something that everybody needs right now. So that makes me feel like my time is well spent. And I hope that you will feel yours is too. I'm a master trainer and a trainer of trainer um, status person with tapping. You may have heard about that before. It's emotional uh, freedom techniques is the most common kind of tapping. And it's part of a burgeoning field called energy psychology. What's the important part of it? It's a way to feel better fast. And it's a way that we can teach one another how to take care of ourselves. And that's what we want to do. And most especially, I have a heart for taking care of those who are our youngest and most vulnerable. That means let's talk about teaching them how to take care of themselves too. And today we're going to be talking about how to do that in an easy to learn, easy to show or teach, and easy to remember way to do that. And of course, it starts with you. But back to you, Nicole, let's do this. Let's do this, John D. Um, So first question I have for you today is when is it good? What is when is a good time to teach emotional first aid? What a great question. Yes. Well, it's when you don't need it. It's like firemen. They don't practice during the middle of a fire. They practice so they'll be ready for a fire, right? And this is why if you're a school child, you know that all those times you go, oh no, it's another fire drill. You can hear the boredom dripping off their voice. That's exactly the time to learn any of these kinds of skills and practice them because we want to do it so much that it becomes automatic, second nature. That's when we want to teach them is when we don't need it so that when we do need it, it comes back like that. Okay, so um, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. So as we go into this and we're saying, hey, parents, here's what you need. This is what it looks like to help your children through difficult times. Where does it Mm -hmm. start? Not when, but where? Well, you know, I think it starts right where you are in the moment because this is an everyday toolbox. Okay, and the great news is even though it's an everyday toolbox, it is perfect for times of trouble. So that means that no matter how the uh, the situation is escalating, you have some things that will help you. I like to say that this is emotional first aid. And some people don't understand what that means, so hopefully they will really soon. But what we're talking about is how do you navigate and handle the world as a calm, resourceful, rational human being? Well, you would be somewhat, uh, let's say, fancy words for that might be, I'm emotionally regulated. What does that mean? Well, it means I'm balanced, I'm sturdy, I'm neutral, I'm open, I'm ready. 
right? I'm a big fan of just using words that are everyday clear. I often say I talk like an eight-year-old <laughs> because eight-year-olds know enough about how to express themselves, but probably not enough to, to hide things so well. So if you're if your job is to help people understand, then you want to do that clarity, right? So you use the everyday words. So emotional first aid, if you had a toolbox that you could give every child of that, that's gonna help them just better manage whatever's going on in whatever kind of situation they find themselves in. And if they do get activated or upset, then it's going to help them know how to release the harmful effects of that instead of carrying them around or holding on to them. And so in that way, we're sort of inoculating them from traumatic experience and encoding. So those are bigger words, but that just means holding on to troubling times instead of resolving them. And that's what we're up to today is yeah. learning how to not take that on. Right. So basically what I hear you saying is we need to work with our children with saying, hey, this is a situation that's going on right now. This is how you respond to it. And this is how you deal with it in that moment so that right. they have that release. Right. And it doesn't turn into a traumatic experience, experience right? right? It just becomes a situation or an occurrence as opposed yeah. to something that they're going to carry with them until they're 50 years old, right? And exactly. that's not an exaggeration, you guys. It's really not an exaggeration. Not um, at all. And, and you know, for people like you and I, we, we talk about this and we go, we're teaching these youngsters how to not become clients. Right, right. right? We, we, we want, you hear a lot of professionals say, I want to be out of work. Right. But what does that really mean? <laughs> what does that really mean? I don't want to have a job with that. Right. To me, what that means, especially since I focus on resilience and trauma, it means that early intervention aspect to help children on the onset of trauma, as opposed to trying to help them as they go through late childhood, adolescence, adulthood Absolutely. into late adulthood. Right. When in a way Absolutely. it becomes a little bit too, not too late. It's never too late to deal with it, but it becomes more difficult because it becomes more deep seated. Right. Absolutely. And, and somewhat like the princess and the pea, you know, putting mm -hmm. mattresses on top of it all the time, instead of going to the symptom, right. Or the original right. causality is going to be much more comfortable for them, lighter mm -hmm. load to carry. Um, he, here's something I, I say often, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. But the truth is almost every child you know is going to go through troubling times. Mm -hmm. They're either already been exposed to it or they're going to be. And so the best we can do perhaps is come down to that level of factual, neutral state of affairs and just go, okay, if everybody is either going to encounter it or already has, let's get to work right away and give them the tools they need in the moment in the moment and then the stuff that has happened that they've been carrying chances are good that you've got some cred credibility with them now and they're going to be able to turn over some older things too because they now feel connection and they mm -hmm. feel safety and absolutely. they have a level of trust that they're starting to build with you that is absolutely correct and i agree Let's talk about the caregiver. Mm -hmm. I want to know what happens when the caregiver ignores um, their needs first. Ah, well, a popular model, right? Um, what what happens most often in my experience? I just want to be clear. This is my experience of this, and I've been at it for a little while. Um, is that we do. People who go into caregiving generally are very caring and want to help people. And they typically come from a background where they've had some trouble and they don't want somebody else to go through that. So you're already predisposed to be carrying a lot, right? And then the next thing that I see them do is they say, well, you know, I'll take care of myself later when things calm down. 
or, um, you know, I just need to do one more person, one more thing, one more call, one more this, one more that. And so that's what I call distracting through productive looking activity. But what we're doing is we're delaying self-care. And what happens is just like you go to a bank, you go to an ATM, you keep taking money out. At some point, there's no more, right? Right. It has to be, or a gas station, right? You can't keep driving past every gas station thinking for some reason that it's magically just going to jump in your tank. You have to take some responsibility for saying, I need to refuel. I need rest or I need quiet, or I need refueling, or I need meditation, I, whatever it is. And so what happens is just like um, everybody who, who's been on an airplane hears them say, first, if the oxygen mask comes down, put it on your cell. Then pay attention to the child because they know that people's natural thing is to go, oh my gosh, and try to wrestle the mask onto the child who's going, what are you doing to me, right? And meanwhile, you're losing all your oxygen and you're losing, that means you're losing all your smarts about how to stay grounded and help them. And so what happens is you become oxygen deprived. What good are you? So there's three different, you know, metaphors for that's what happens to caregivers who don't take care of themselves first. Right. So the important lie, the importance lies in understanding how to self-care. Right. It goes yes, into and that you need it. You need it and you deserve it. And in order to serve the way that you want to serve, you have to do it. Okay. So next question for you is you have <clears throat> authored this book or handbook as we're, we're calling yes. um, for specifically teaching care providers how to, um, to implement emotional first aid to the children that they uh, care for and provide care for. Right. Now, is there a specific audience for that? Who does that encompass? That's a great question. And by the way, I, um, here's the camera. I co-authored this with Deborah Miller, PhD, who uh, has been working for years as a child advocate in a pediatric oncology hospital in Oaxaca. And so I have a really good colleague who also is uh, got a medical background, just so you know. So we've kind of got two people coming from two different worlds of caregiving. This one is acute and this one is every day, right? And so the two of us together combined in answering your question, well, it's for everybody who cares about kids. That may be you have some, that may be you like them, that may be that you don't have any, but you work as a teacher, a counselor, uh, a, a child care provider, a babysitter, a grandparent, um, somebody who works around an area where a lot of children congregate, community center. Okay. You know, so all of those are available for that persons who care about children moniker. And the book is actually divided into three parts. First, take care of yourself, just like you were saying. You, it all starts with you. Second, then you take care of the kid, kids and children. The third part is how do you teach others to do that too? Because we want this diaspora of information to go out to everybody. My personal goal is a million kids by the end of the year get exposed to this information. Okay. And so, Johnny, as you know, one of the goals of this as well, or of the mental health and um, healing series is to provide tools for what I call the healing box. So yeah. as people are beginning to address their traumas and um, try to better understand how they can help their children. And let's just be honest, the, the things that we have been dealing with for the last week alone is enough to have children Absolutely. like what in the world is this? As right. parents, how would we take this tool and how would we implement emotional first aid to our children knowing that they're the world is chaotic right now right and we need to be able to center ourselves yes we know that right 
But we do. The question but, then, go ahead. I, I just wanted you to finish your question because I realized I was about to launch into an answer and I didn't fully let you establish your question. <laughs> no, but you know, we have a connection like that. You know where I'm yeah. going. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Um, how, how does a parent then begin to help when they see that their child is frantic and scared and frightened mm -hmm. of what is basically the unknown at this present moment? Right. And what we might look at as um, uncertain times. This is really good. So first of all, let's just say we're talking about how to do strategies and interventions that are in the moment, right? To prevent them from taking stuff on. So we know that. Another important part to begin with is let's let's say that as a person who is in charge of taking care of children um whether because it's their family or they do it for a living that we're going to become aware of what's happening and we're always going to be looking out for them right so things like you and i have been talking about lately what's going on in my city what's going on in my block what's going on in my neighborhood my school etc and being aware right there's an awareness factor that we are charged with doing. But let's also say maybe you care for children, but you're, you're not involved in that way. Um, so how would you know? And one of the things that I'd like to say is awareness can also be moved from events, current events, and onto what do you see in front of you? If you see somebody who is observably shaking, that's kind of obvious, right? Oh, something's wrong, right? But if it's not quite so uh, obvious, it might be a shutting down, a withdrawal, a pulling back, a hiding. It could be um, clingy or rocking. All of these are tells, right? And so these are ways for us to be reminded that people, let's just go back to children. Children are telling us all the time how they're doing. It's up to us to decode that. And I'm showing you some of the somatic or physical things because that might not be my child. I might not be familiar with that child. But if I see that their behaviors are explosive or withdrawing, I can be pretty guaranteed that something's going on with that child. Okay. And so I'm just going to say it's usually playing out right in front of you. And so I'm back to this awareness piece. What do you see about what's going on? Because I'm going to say we have a few steps of observing and then listening and then interpreting what you just saw and taking action. Okay, so I think I jumped past where you were going with that, but I wanted to make sure that I say whether they're your kids or not, kids are trying to communicate. People are always trying to communicate, but children more so until they get older and they've learned how to mask it. Okay, so um, I'm also going to invite the audience to ask questions as we yes. go along. You guys yes. do not have to just sit. If you have a question that you have as this information is being provided, please, by all means, type in that, um, that question and mm -hmm. we will address it <clears throat> As, um, as they come up and as we can. John D., um, yeah. clearly our children are always giving us signs, right? We interpret them to be like behavior issues or whatever else, when technically there may just be some underlining reason why that behavior is occurring. So when a parent is noticing that, and we're talking about implementing emotional first aid, what is a technique or something that that parent can do, can tap into to better address the need of that child when they see, mm -hmm. when they see that child going that, that way right. to help them? Well, let's start here. The, the first thing that all people need, no one more than children, is a sense of safety, a sense of it. 
right? Even if all hell is breaking loose around you, a sense of safety with that person and the ability to connect with that person is the most basic human need. So how can you do that? Well, you can create some calm for yourself, around yourself, meaning deliberate calm, right? If I am aware and conscious, I'll be saying, okay, I'm a role model. And in this moment, they're looking to me for their sense of direction. What do I mean by that? Remember when you've, uh, all of us have seen children on a playground, little kids just beginning to walk and run and tumble. And what happens when they fall down? They immediately turn around, even if they haven't gotten up yet, they immediately turn around and look at their caregiver or older person. What are they looking for? They're looking for the message from the caregiver or older person, even if it's a sibling. Am I okay? Is this okay? Am I all right? Am I supposed to be upset or this is okay? This is normal? Right? So we know children are predisposed to already look to us. Let's just call them a taller person. Might be their older sister, you know? They're, they're predisposed to look for the taller person for survival information. How am I doing? Right? So that's one thing. We need to be the person in charge of calm. So that is an act of consciousness, really. That's what we're talking about, right? The next thing is we need to be able to communicate clearly and concisely, whatever it is in times of trouble, okay? For instance, uh, we call this verbal first aid, by the way. It, none of these things are branded names. These are concepts, emotional first aid, verbal first aid. But for instance, when we're upset, this is another type of consciousness that, that we can help our kids with. The consciousness of, okay, th things are happening fast. I need to be on my very best, calmest, grounded behaviors. And I need to communicate that very clearly from my face, my body language, and my words. OK, this is long before we get to let's call them somatic or body strategies, which this book has plenty of. But this is conceptually where you start. It starts with you, starts with you modeling safe behavior, grounded. And that you are going to model for them to stay calm. And in your voice, instead of like, oh, Jimmy, ah, uh, well, oh, I don't know. Well, get, get your coat. No, have, where's your sister? Um, I don't. All of that is very normal, but it's panic talk. And what does it do to them? It elevates and escalates. What's different is when you are harnessing that level of competence and consciousness and you go, wait, hold on. Let's get your shoes. You know, just ching, 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 ching. It's very small and they can hear it. Same children running in a pool like crazy. And everybody, what do they say? They go, don't run, don't run, stop, you're going to hurt yourself. Instead of walk, walk, right? So we're trying to cut through all this noise. So conceptually, those are all the things in a nutshell I wanted to say. Then, then we move over to the somatic. Is that where you want to go next, which is the, the kind of strategies and interventions that are about the physical body or teaching? Will that do? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Great. So the first thing that everybody since cave moms knew to do was take five, just breathe, take a breath, right? There's a reason that all the great meditators of the world are, it's all about breath work. It is the bottom line for first aid in the human body. We have to have oxygen in order for our muscles to work and we have to have oxygenated blood in order for our prefrontal cortex, that thing we're so proud of right here, to work. Okay, so breath work can be as simple as just taking a breath. Okay, honey, take a breath. When somebody comes in the door, <laughs> Take a breath. 
right? Mm -hmm. The second type of take a breath is to direct the breath into breath work. That sounds too fancy for me. I'm really like all over the place. I have to work hard to just be simple, calm. So my breath would be, okay, I know I need to breathe deeper and exhale longer. That's the bottom line about breath, right? Breathe deeper, exhale longer. What does that mean? Just <gasps> deeper breath and <sighs> <sighs> right? And little kids love that because you look really silly. Absolutely. That reminds me of the story I was telling you the other day about when my my son, he was about three or four years old and um, he had what he called the passenger. <laughs> it was past fire and um, he, he lost the last one and the poor thing was truly his friend. He was probably about three or four and um, I, he was hysterical. And me having experience, I was still traumatized by his, him being hysterical, right? But then I collected myself because I realized that me panicking wasn't going to help him any. And I taught him how to breathe deep and let out, right? Yeah. The, the key to that is he is now going to be 13 in September. And whenever he is in distress, I ask him, how do you handle that? Mm -hmm. Right? Because I want him to recall it. I want him to remember what he was taught. And he says, I breathe. I said, okay, then start breathing. Right? That's great. Right. To calm, to calm him down. And I guess I say that to say, it's never too early to teach your child these methods. Because that, that's, that's what I was going to bring up. You yeah. told me you started teaching him at three. Yes. So 10 yeah. years ago, yes. he knew that the first strategy is breathe. Right. Right. And he turned it around on me one time. He saw, <laughs> he turned it around on me and he was like, mom. And he sat in the middle of the floor and he took this, I don't know. He watched too much TV then, I guess. Um, yo yoga pose, put his fingers like this, knees on elbows or elbows on knees, however you want to say that. And he's like, okay, mom, it's time to sit down and it's time to calm down. We need to breathe. Yes. And at that point, I couldn't do anything but take a picture and laugh and relax because I realized what I had taught him. It worked for him, but he knew at a very young age that it would work for other people as well. So I say right. that to say it's never too soon, never too soon to start implementing these tools for your children. I love so, it. Yes. Never too soon and never too late. And I, I relate, you know, when my daughter once said I was really upset and she went, you need to tap. <laughs> <laughs> and I just burst out into laughter and I went, wow, what a great idea. And I started to tap because, of course, she's right. Because you know, and, and once you teach them, there you go. Right. So this is about always taking care of yourself first. And you taught him at three years old. Hey, what do you do? So you taught him two things. You taught him problem solving. Right. Right. Got to get some oxygen in the brain before you can problem solve. And this is how you do it. You start here. You breathe. And the other thing you taught him is to take care of himself. Oh, you know how to do that. Jack, ah, what do you do? And I have that. to admit it was out of pure selfishness. <clears throat> and a need to maintain my own sanity at the time. <laughs> I don't but, think that there's a penalty for that, by the way. No, there's not a penalty for it because it came out perfect. It it yeah. worked and it still, it still works. And to be quite honest, and I'm not saying teach your child and they will always remember to do it. You have to understand that I still have to remind my almost 13 year old that this is what he needs to do in order right. to be OK in hopes that when he becomes an older adult, he will then say, OK, this is what I need to do without prompting. Right. So they'll need prompting for it for for some time. But you you still implement it and you still put it. Yeah, there. But the, it's like reinforcement and learning yeah. is repetition and reinforcement. And so, yeah, you're helping them learn. But that autopilot, that automatic is, again, we'll go back to the fireman. You know, 
they they hear the alarm and they slide down the pole and everything's lined up. They just jump, 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 jump. It's deliberately arranged for their success and it's deliberately repeated and repeated and repeated until they're not thinking about that. You know, by the time they're in the truck and they're already on the way, they may be thinking about something. But at the moment, they are practicing behavior that's been reinforced and prompted, as you say, mm -hmm. and practiced. That's how we get piano fingers or bicycle memory, muscle memory. Any athlete can tell you that. It's a practiced response. And in this case, it's all about keeping oneself safe and then being able to problem solve. So tell me more, and I have this up on the screen and it's been here for a while just because I believe that it fits. But let's talk more about empowerment of your child. Great. Because I believe that that's super important to, mm -hmm. to discuss here today. I do too. Thank you. You know, some this isn't mine. I wish I could take credit, but it's not mine. Somebody told me, have you noticed how by the time children get to middle school, that's where they get into trouble? And I said, what do you mean by that? I think I know what you mean. And they went, well, if you spent uh, Head Start or Pre-K all the way up until fifth or sixth grade saying, sit down, take out your book, put away your book, get your shoes, get your coat, don't forget your homework, here's your soap, ba 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 <laughs> and then suddenly they get to sixth or seventh grade middle school or uh, whatever, junior high school, whatever you're calling it there. And they're like, OK, well, we'll see you in class. Here's your schedule and you can go find your locker and here's a combination and you need to make sure you get yourself there on time and whatever. And bye. You're, you're going from helicopter teacher parent moment into free fall. And so what we're doing in the smaller years is very understandable. We are training them through repetition to learn. But at a certain point, we're enabling them by telling them everything to do instead of saying, what do we do now? Who has a good solution for this? Right? So we enable them instead of empower them if we just keep on telling them what to do all the time. So empowering them is what you did with your son. Let me teach you what to do. Let me teach you how to help yourself. That's empowering him to know he can do it. And how does that particularly connect to emotional regulation during times outside of the breathing? You know what yeah, I mean? But empowerment, absolutely. You know what I mean? I do. And so, Let's talk for a second about uh, two things, body awareness, body sensation awareness, and the idea of emotion awareness. So emotional literacy or emotional wisdom and somatic or physical felt sense. We teach them empowerment by saying, D did you know that your body is designed to? Did you know how you are made, you are made to have messages coming at you all the time to help you decide how to best take care of yourself. No, what do you mean? Well, the good news is we have some automatic things that everybody owns, their biological legacy, if you will, so that when you touch a hot stove, you don't think about it. It's directly wired in that you go, whoa, hot. And you won't do that again because that hurts, <laughs> That's right? <not> That's <laughs> when you start remembering. But your your uh, oldest part of your evolutionary brainstem is in charge of whoa, right? Because if you had to let it go all the way through your cognitive powers, you'd probably burn yourself badly. So you have a beautiful design. What are we doing? We're empowering them by telling them that they already are designed for success and survival. All we have to do is be listening to it, watching for it, right? A second sense would be, have you ever noticed how when you go to a situation that doesn't feel very safe that your stomach starts talking to you? 
Have you, as a parent or a caregiver, noticed that anytime there's something wrong, it's, I don't feel so good, my stomach doesn't feel so good, my tummy hurts, right? It's a first line of distress. And we're teaching them, we're empowering them to listen to their body, right? We're showing them what their body is really for instead of the abuse that we see people who don't understand what their body is for, right? Mm -hmm. How do you teach them it's a temple or a, a thing of wonder if you haven't empowered them with how they're fearfully and wonderfully made? Okay, what's another sense? Hey, have you ever noticed when you get goosebumps and you don't even know why? That's so your you're body. Saying making them aware of when their system is saying, hey, there's danger or hey, this is not right. Check this out. Check this out. And in this way, um, they can then learn how to react positively, appropriately, look for help before they become frantic, right? Before that flight or fight kicks in, so to speak. That's right. It's an innate reaction in, in all of us, right? And we right. kind of don't want them going like this all the time. Right. Or shutting it down. If yeah. it's uncomfortable and yeah. we push past that, yeah, sometimes we have to be uncomfortable and be patient. Yeah, sometimes we have to be uncomfortable and do the hard thing and apologize or tell the truth or whatever. That's mm -hmm. not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But this is part of empowering them, is teaching them. Yes, son. Yes, daughter. That's true. However, there's many times where discomfort just suddenly appears out of nowhere. And I need you to know that's a signal that there's something you need to pay attention to. Your body is trying to take care of you. Okay. And when you shut that down, you're not going to be as safe. Okay. Right? So that's that half of it. But it's also important for parents to be cued in on those, right, as well. If oh, they yeah. are to empower their children into knowing what those are, they have to, it goes back to teaching them what we know, right? So if you feel something like this, talk about it, right? Yes. Don't press it. Don't hide it. Don't say that it's nothing. And actually giving them a voice so that they can learn to emotionally regulate early. And we're not looking at tantrums in the middle of the grocery store. Exactly. Right. Because I know that parents are frustrated. They're just like, well, I have sure. this child and he's continuously falling out in the middle of the store. And how do I how do I take care of that? Well, that's an emotional dysregulation. Right. There had to there's usually a sign before that happens. And no, the answer no is was the straw that broke the camel's back. But it wasn't right. the reason for the fallout. And if we right. can teach them early to regulate that by saying, hey, I'm feeling or I feel like or something does not sure. feel right to me. Mm -hmm. um, that's well, that means we have to be good listeners. Correct. That means we have to be safe listeners, safe mm -hmm. people to come to with what's going on for you. We have to actually be listening. The other thing is we have to prepare for success. You know, this is not a parenting show, no. but but the the idea that as caregivers that we're going to probably know, especially if our child is volatile and has a lot of issues with just trying to get comfortable or gets frustrated very easily or goes zero to 10 uh, with frustration really fast. We get to know that child. And we get to prepare for that. For instance, we say, I'm making this up totally. We say, okay, we're going to the store and we're going to actually practice how to get in touch with when we're frustrated and talk about it instead of act it out. Oh, right. That means that I am not going to the store when I have to go get some milk. When I have to get some dinner on the table, that means I'm going to the store when I don't have to because I'm preparing for success by teaching an object lesson. So here's this as we talk about this. And again, if you guys have questions when this is when we're sure. having this discussion, please post the questions. Mm -hmm. um, but 
as a parent, and I'm going to play devil's advocate here um, as we talk about empowering our children. Okay, some parents think, okay, if I empower my child, then this child's going to have a voice and this child is going to become disrespectful, right? And then here I here I go saying, hey, I want you to emotionally regulate. So here's your voice, but right, I'm I'm not feeling. Uh, that right there. And I can tell you as a parent who has always told my child, speak up. If you have something to say, say it, don't suppress it. Right. Right. Because I don't want you holding it inside, walking around moping because, um, my nerves can't handle that (laughs) to be, to be honest. Right. And most parents are just like, I, I, but I I think think we're missing the idea of how, Right. Exactly. It's not. It's how you teach them. It's how you teach them. Because do you speak to your child with respect? Right. Do you tell them you respect and expect them to do the same? Correct. Yes. I always tell my son, it's it's, you can say what you need to say, but you need to do it in a respectful manner and you have to teach them how to do it. Right. So when we, when we talk about empowering your children, we're not talking about empowering your children to be disobedient, but we're also talking about empowering your children to, when they become adults, they don't believe that they have to suppress what they're feeling and swallow their feelings um, because then they don't get things accomplished and they experience more trauma in, in that effect. So exactly. And so what we're teaching them is what kind of information Mm -hmm. are you aware of and how do you express it to somebody in a way that makes sense and they can help you with that Mm -hmm. or just to let them know, you know, or just to feel like you've expressed how you're feeling, but we model it essentially. Yeah. And, and so we also teach them about the tells. When I feel heat coming up like this, Chuck, that means I know I'm really starting to get upset about something. Mm-hmm. Right? I can either start screaming and running around, or I can go, I'm getting upset, which is just the truth. I don't even know what it's about. I'm getting upset as an announcement right? It's preframed to where I'm going, but I'm teaching them to pay attention and to say it, but not necessarily to shut down everything around them just to say, Hey, John, I can't hear it when it's so loud. I need you to just tell me simply what's going on. I'm really angry. I'm really upset. I'm really whatever. Now we're getting into the other half of that conversation, which is emotional literacy. What is that feeling? Right. Right. What is that? What do we call that? And what do you do about that? And if there's too much, I mean, I'm a big fan of teaching simple language like too much, too much. Even little kids, and that's what we're getting at is teaching them younger and younger and younger, right? Even Mm -hmm. little kids can get through that too much. That works for peers, siblings, parents, grandparents, teachers, instead of lashing out. So we've got to teach them how to do that. And part of it is, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing to myself thinking about a, a friend of mine who took his son to a restaurant, probably two and a half, three years old. And he said, we're going to a restaurant. We're going to one that you want to go to, but there's rules. I ha- We have a question. Oh, great. Okay. So um, it says, if your child has I mean, if you have a child that has ADHD and Asperger's, mm-hmm. um, would you practice these or is there another way to bring it to their attention? That is a really. That's a great question. question. That's a great question. And just full disclosure, I don't know about you, Nicole, but I am not an ADD specialist. I, I'm not an autistic spectrum specialist whatsoever. But I do know that getting to know your child and how, or or your student, and Mm -hmm. how they react, and each one being at at a different place is a way to customize what's going on for them. And even if all I can do is get right uh, in the zone that I figured out they like, lots of kids like to get too close, lots of kids can't stand it if you get too close. What -hmm. is your child like, right? You're gonna have to tailor it to them 
But even if it's just breathe with me, even if it's just stop, mm -hmm. talk to me, yes. whatever it is, it's going to take repetition and customization. And I wish that I was brilliant enough to go, oh, I know exactly what to do. But each <laughs> child is different. And they have especially high needs for customization. Correct. You are correct. Um, me, my background, um, advocating for children with special needs in the school districts um, and having worked at the uh, UC Davis Mind Institute for nine years. Um, I learned a little something working with developmental pediatricians. Not enough to say that I'm an expert, but enough to say that what John D is saying is absolutely correct. Um, even if your child has ADHD or Asperger's or um, whichever, it still is, she's right, it's going to be customized to the need of your child because every child is different, but it is possible to implement these tools and skills that we're talking about with your child who may have those um, um, ADHD or Asperger's or um, autism in general, right? Yes, it's possible, absolutely. But it depends on how you do it, right? And when, uh, again, and it's got to be in times of calm, doesn't it? You're welcome. And so let's let's just, oh, I hope I guys got that camera backwards. You see that? That looks like somebody's going to be quiet, right? Yes. This is called shush. But again, some people are very tactically sensitive and they mm -hmm. can't stand touch theirs or anybody else's and others are clingy and just can't get enough of it. And it's bizarre how polarized those are. But if you can take something this simple and show them early when it is calm and model it, I would do something like, um, this is just for any everyday kind of situation. But if I start going, hmm, 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 give me a minute. Let me just think about that. Just going to breathe and think about that. This is a meridian energy technique. It's a strategy for calming down the governing meridian that runs from underneath your nose and inside your mouth all the way down to your pubic bone. It is a way to start calming. But nobody cares about all that stuff about, uh, unless they're interested in meridian science. What am I interested in? If I'm a teacher, I'm interested in everybody maybe shutting their mouth and taking five for a minute because I'm about to be overwhelmed. Everybody, it's time to shush. Take your hand. Give me your index finger. Put it under your nose. Go across your lips. Breathe. <laughs> so this is anchoring under here, which means your mouth isn't open. It can't be talking. You're breathing. So you're getting the take five effect. And you know you're calming down the body's nervous system. This book has plenty of those kinds of things. Simple, in the moment, tiny, tiny, tiny interventions for helping them. Okay, here's right. another. If somebody's really kinetic and you want to help them calm down, you might say, hold the head. Now hold the back. Now just hold it. Let them do the rocking. The rocking is actually a somatic intervention they're soothing with. Mm -hmm. But if they can hold on to their own bad self, front and back, <laughs> right? They're treating themselves in three ways now. The frontal lobe the uh, dorsal lobe back here, as well as this this rocking that they're doing. So these are the kinds of things that if you can understand what that might do for them, then you can model for them very easily and everybody can do it together. Everybody, the room is getting really loud. Everybody do this, take five. And breathe, breathe with me. I wanna hear you breathe. And you're saying like, it, let's say there's a daycare or a first grade class or something like that and things yep. are just, ah, 
educators can implement these things to That's basically right. bring their their children that they're caring for for the day back to a baseline, which That's is right. absolutely regulated amazing. state. Right. Um, there's a question. Um, will we post the books in the co in the comment um, at the end? Yes, I will post the book in the comments at the end um, so that you can know where to purchase it at. You can actually purchase it on Amazon. Let me go ahead and tell you that now. And you're just going to search John D's name, John D. Whitest. That's how you're going to do that. However, five people who registered will be selected to actually get a copy that is autographed. Where is it? Johnny, it's, on the, oh, it's on the front page. It's on the front page. That's been <laughs> autographed by Johnny. I am so, that was horrible. Anyways, yes. <laughs> so you can get the book on Amazon and it comes paperback and it comes um, and Kindle too. Kindle as well. So, um, and can I go ahead and plug this? We yeah. made this book cheap, cheap, cheap because we want you to buy several copies. Why do we want you to do that? We would love you to have one in your home. We would love you to give one to your grandchildren or to your children. Uh, we would love you to put it in your pediatric office. We would love you to take it to school or a library or a community center or a children's um, after school. We would love you to share this with everybody. And that's why we made it very inexpensive to do. And while we're at it, I'm just going to say one more thing. Yes. There are pieces in here that have um, little charts, when to do what, and each of these interventions has um, illustrations about how to do it, when to do it, what's it called. Very, very easy. And then just because none of us think really well when the chips are down, we have a little... Um, chart for you when to do what and what i tell people to do is xerox these laminate them put them on a little uh key ring hang it up just like keys it, you can always see it when the kids see it and they see that come down that's another form of reinforcement or you can if if you're in a group setting just like nicole said you can assign somebody today who gets to go bring the who gets to go bring the strategy chart or who gets to bring the movement chart or who gets to get the calm down stuff down from the wall, who gets to pick what we're going to do today, right? They could do that by the illustration, but you give them a little bit of uh, responsibility and choice. And there you go. Suddenly we're all learning. We are. So that brings me to one of the things that I saw mm. in, um, in your book is you talk about six phases of events, yeah. which tend to be important in learning how to implement emotional first aid, if I'm not mistaken. You're absolutely right. Um, okay. f first of all, that means that there's a time for everything, right? <laughs> there's yes. never not a time that you can use it. But let's also say in this time of COVID-19, which is all around us, pandemic is different than event. Okay. Mm -hmm. A pandemic is, I don't know where it came from. I, I didn't know what was going on for a while. All of a sudden it was here. I don't know when it's leaving. Right. It's a chronic uncertain state with heightened fear potential. So that's slightly different, but P.S., I'll talk about that in a minute, and it's called during, right? Um, for events, though, let's say, you know, when I was a little kid in Florida, getting ready for the hurricane, right? There is a just before. We know that the hurricane is probably going to be here by 6 p.m., right? And so there's a just before time when you can, this is phase one, when you can uh, remark with, about that with your child or children and say, okay, everybody, we know that there's a hurricane alert, right? What does that mean? Or if they're an older child, hey, everybody, before we dismiss, we all know that this is going to be happening. Anybody got some thoughts about that? Or how are we feeling about that? 
right? Because in that time, we're, we're talking about the, the physical reaction or an intuitive hit or a thought that they're having, and we let them express it. We don't hide it. We don't try to pretend it's not going on, but we talk about it in age appropriate and situationally appropriate ways. And then in doing that, we can remind them you've got your breath work or you've got your shushing or you've got your pretzel, which really helps your body get calm. So each of these are little names for the in the moment strategies that are in this book. Okay. That's just before that's phase one. Phase two is as it begins. Oh my gosh, here we go. Right. And the roller coaster, it's like, oh, my gosh, here we go, right? But in a real-life event, it's going to be as it's beginning. And generally, we have a flood of adrenaline and other hormonal chemicals because it's preparing our body to defend itself or do something, right? So we've got different kinds of interventions for that. And one of the ones that I think um, is very helpful to people, uh, I already showed you, which is just everybody just hold on for a second. We're just going to do this for about a minute and then we're going to take our next action. And now I'm starting to use verbal first aid as well. Shorter directive sentences. Grab your head. Hold on tight. Breathe with me. Okay, good. Now I'd like everybody to get their coats. Line up at the door. Boom and boom and boom, right? The third stage is essentially what we're in right now, which is called during. It's in the middle of it. We're in the thick of it right now, right? Um, it depends on where you are in the country or in the world how far in the during you are, but it doesn't matter. During, what do we do? Well, we know that we can ground or self-regulate. We know that we can do a couple of things. And one of them that I would probably uh, say to everybody is uh, a tension tamer or uh, the finger squeezes. And these are in the book too. And finger squeezes are this simple. Hold on, embrace your finger, nice and gentle and slow, and I want you to just hold on to that until you feel the pulse. That's your heart taking care of you. Beautiful. Now let's go to the next finger. Embrace that. Nice and warm, not too tight, until you feel the pulse. There it is. That's your heart taking care of you. And the next, nice and warm, embrace the finger, Wait, feel the pulse. There you go. Good job. This finger. Yeah, you're learning just how tight to hold it. Perfect. And there's the pulse. Good job. Great. And the last finger. Go ahead. Listen and wait. Feel the pulse. This is you taking care of you. Beautiful. Great. You can go on to the next hand and treat the other hand, or you can stop right there. But these are things you can do together. And this is what is in training your energy, if you will. I'm connecting with you in safe, proactive, emotional first aid. Amazing. John D., I thank you. I believe that this is the perfect spot to say thank you and thank you to everybody who has tuned in. Um, we have down here at the bottom, you will now be able to see where to order the book. And then here, if you guys are interested in talking more to John D outside of this setting, she can be reached at the information on the screen. Um, I have to tell you, I enjoy and love having these conversations with um, John D. Um, but that right there, that's relaxing right there. Mm. <laughs> 
and it works and it helps. And that is a amazing example of emotional first aid. Cause if you were excited up to this point, I challenge you to say that just listening to John D right now didn't just bring you and center you and mm-hmm. calm you in a, in a space that you were not exactly expecting. Um, I thank you for allowing me to have the platform to tell people what people have taught me, right? I'm paying it forward. I want to remind them that children overall, it doesn't matter how well or badly you do these exercises, call strategies, they, children need to know from you. They need to know and feel they're safe, right? A felt sense of safety, a sense of safety. And it all starts with you. That means we're the teacher, we're the modeler, we're the demoer, and they take their cues from you. If you're flipping out, if you're really calm, if you're shouting, if you're soothing, they're taking their cues from you. And they develop trust in the signals that you're going to send them because after they come out of an event, right? So just after the event or the initial recovery or the long-term recovery, they know they're safe and you're with them and you're still here and they made it through. And this is what is called building resilience or fostering resilience, right? And so please, please just, if nothing else, remember all they need is to feel they are safe with you and that they take their cues from you. Thank you. John D, thank you so much for providing tools for our alert listeners to pull into their healing box. And um, I think that you were the perfect person to kick this series off. And just so that you know, John D and I talked briefly on bringing her back to more specifically yeah. talk about um, tapping um, technique and and so forth. So you guys can look forward to seeing this beautiful face again. Mm, thank you. <sighs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the privilege of kicking off your series. I'm oh, delighted absolutely. that you're doing this for everybody. <laughs> you know what? It's a must, right? It is a must. In the times that we're in right now and in everybody's emotions are high, I believe that this was the perfect time to bring this forward and say, here, this is how you can take care of you. This is how you can take care of your child. Please use it. Please use it and use it. Like I like to say, please wear it out. Um, (laughs) That's great. Wear it out because Mm -hmm. right now, outside your homes and in this world, there is a lot of unknowns. And if we can stay emotionally stable, Right. and implement the tools that we have to be okay, we are going to make it through what is uncertain times right now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys no, this series will, the next installment of this series is going to happen on June 16th and it will be in regards to Ang- um, we're going to discuss a little bit about anger management and tools on how to better um, regulate yourself. So we're still talking about uh, self-regulation and mindfulness in regards to knowing your cues and knowing the cues of others in um, mm-hmm. situations that can cause you to be upset. So that's where we are going with this the next time. So please, I look forward to um, having you guys come back with us on June 16th. Um, There will be a flyer to follow um, with the appropriate information and how you can join us again. Like I said, this series is going to go on and on as long as I have people who are willing to come forward and talk to you and provide tools for you until your healing box is overflowed and you have to get another one and you have many of them with many tools, we are going to, I am going to continue to come to you with information that's going to help you heal. Because as I always say, resilience is a journey. And if you don't have tangible tools, that journey is going to be hard. And so I want to provide you with the tangible tools you need to get to the end of your journey much better than when you started it. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, Jondi. And you you guys have a beautiful day. Thank you so much and enjoy. Enjoy. Bye. Bye.